So good day, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Community Central. My name is Brian Proffitt with the Red Hat Open Source Program Office, and we are really happy to have a lot of great guests on today who are going to be talking about community CRM. Before I introduce them, however, the usual housekeeping notes. Um, if you're not familiar with the uh, Blue Jeans platform, please fill in the Q&A tool for questions for our guests. We will get to the most voted on questions after their discussion and presentations. So that out of the way, I am very, very pleased to uh, introduce um, four guests today. So starting off, uh, Catherine Paganini, who is the head of marketing and community for Buoyant. Um, she will be sort of kicking off the discussion. We also have Odyssey Lemis. Le Amidstis. I knew I goofed that name up. I'm so sorry. Um, he'll pronounce it for you, um, who is uh, uh, with developer relations at NetData. Um, Michael Hall, community manager from Influx Data. And finally, Patrick Woods, who is the CEO of Orbit. So without any further ado, and with the construction noise coming in in the background, um, I will hand it off to Catherine, and she will get the discussion started. Catherine, thank you so much. Welcome. Okay, great. Thanks for the introduction, and welcome, everyone, to today's panel on community CRMs, a data-driven approach to community major, uh, management. Um, so, yeah, CRMs have been um, a business-critical tool for sales teams for probably as long as I can remember, and they've been incredibly su successful at enabling sales team to take a data to take data driven decisions uh, to generate more revenue and have really become this must have tool of course um, community management is not sales right i mean community manage but community managers do need to know who does what when how often um, to encourage really positive behavior and also foster an engaging community uh, spreadsheets have been commonly used, uh, must be maintained um, to be useful. That can be quite painful. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about community CRMs. That's a kind of newish kind of tool that really automates the data aggregation and allows community major, uh, managers to also take a data-driven approach. So we're joined today, um, as um, Brian already mentioned, by uh, Michael Hall, um, Patrick Woods, and Ot Diceas uh, Lambit, Lamb oh, I'm gonna hand it over to you. I forgot uh, how you told me just before. So welcome everyone, and yeah, over to you. I'm looking forward to that discussion. All right, um, thank you, Catherine, for uh, putting this together and inviting us all to it. Um, should I go ahead and run through my presentation? Yes, please. Okay. All right, can everybody see that? Yeah, I'm hoping that's yes. a yes. Okay, uh, so I'm Michael Hall. Um, I'm the creator of Savannah CRM, which is one of the CRMs we're gonna talk about today. Um, but before I talk about it, I wanna kind of give more of a high level overview of what community CRMs are and why you should be looking into having one. So to start off, um, you know, as Catherine mentioned, the sales CRMs have been around for a long time. That's probably what most people think about when they think about a CRM. You know, it's a tool that the sales team use to keep track of leads and prospects and, and make sales. Um, but that's not really what you want as a community manager or as a community builder. Like the last thing you want to do is use your community as a sales pool and start sending pitches to them and trying to arrange calls. Nothing's going to kill their interest in your community faster than doing that. So why do you want a CRM then for your community? Well, it turns out there's a lot of overlap in the things that a sales CRM does and the things that you as a community professional want to do. For example, having profiles of your members. Sales CRMs are really good about building up context and information around the people that they're contacting. And that's something that you want to have as a community manager too. You want to know who you're talking to, what their interests are, uh, who they've talked to in the past, interactions that they've had. And a CRM is a really great tool for this. This is kind of like the most fun fundamental aspect of a CRM is you know, having these user profiles and keeping this information somewhere. Another key aspect of a sales CRM is something called the sales funnel. Um, and if you're not familiar with this, it's 
really just a way of looking at the people you're engaged with and kind of whittling them down from people you've just contacted, you don't know if they're interested in your product or not, to people who might become a customer, people that you've engaged with in sales talks. And then finally, at the bottom of the funnel, you've got people who actually sign a contract, sign up for your service. It's a crucial part of the sales pipeline. Um, but in community, we've got a very similar kind of workflow where we've got people who come in for the first time, they're just starting to engage, they're not really contributing yet, they're asking questions though. And then over time, they get more involved, they they spend more time in your community, they start to be able to contribute back to it, and then eventually some of them become leaders. So it's all about tracking this kind of process, this pipeline that people go through um, in your community. So sales has a funnel. Um, Savannah kind of inverts that into something we call the engagement pyramid, where every level is built on top of a foundation of the, the one below it. And Orbit, um, and I'm sure Patrick's going to go into this, but they've got the Orbit model where the more active you are in a community, the closer your orbit is to uh, the central product or service. But they're all about just watching that pipeline and making sure that you're not bottlenecked anywhere along the way. And the last big thing that sales CRMs do is they generate a lot of reports. They can take all of this information that they've gathered and aggregate it and graph it and show you tables of all your top members, your most likely prospects. Um, and building different reports for different users, showing different aspects of your data is a big part of that in a sales CRM. And that's also something that we always have to do as community managers. People are always wanting to know what's our community numbers, what's our growth rate like. Um, so being able to track that and being able to report on that is a, a key aspect for us too. So that's what sales CRMs have in common with community needs, but why a specific CRM for community? What can it do? Uh, that you can't do with one of these off-the-shelf sales CRMs. And one of the big ones is just aggregating data. Community is so much bigger than a typical sales funnel is going to look at. You, know, you could have hundreds of people in your sales pipeline, but you could have tens of thousands of people in your community. And they're in all these different places, interacting with all these different people. And you really need something that can aggregate all of that together and give you just one single holistic view of your community. And that's one of the key things that community CRMs do. All of them that I'm aware of connect to multiple sources and bring all that data into one place for you. So you don't have to go look at all these different platforms for numbers and activity history and user profile information. Another thing that they're really good about is letting you collaborate with other people on your community team and other uh, departments within your company. So you can take notes about members to you know, talk about things that you've done with them, engagements you've had. Um, you know, I, I use it to mark people who have been you know, troublesome or, or been overly negative in the community so that we can see at a glance, you know, okay, this person I'm talking to has kind of a sorted history. I need to, you know, kind of be aware of that as I go into that. And that contact history is important too. Uh, you know, I can see who they've engaged with in the past so I can reach out to people and get a little bit more information about that. Um, other people can come in and see their uh, collaboration history there. You know, I, when you think about somebody that you've engaged with, say in this past week, if that person came back in a month or two months, are you going to remember what you talked to them about, what their problem was, what helped them out? Most likely not. If they come and they contact one of your teammates instead of you, somebody who hasn't talked to them before, they're going to have no idea about that history. But if you have a community CRM, you can record all of that and then they can go see, oh, this person talked to Michael a month ago about this topic. Here's what he tried to help him with. Now I've got this background information going in to talk to this community member that makes me uh, more prepared to help them. And then just tracking all of that activity, being able to see what, what topics this person's interested in, what platforms they're active on, who they're talking to the most. Um, just gives you a much better view about who they are, what their needs are, and how you can best help them. And then lastly, they're really good about giving you insights about your community, uh, things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get from these individual platforms alone. You can see the overall activity of your community across all of them. You can see the kinds of content that they're talking about. Um, each CRM is a little bit different in what kind of insights they can give you, but it, it's a key aspect, I think, of uh, all of the community CRMs. And they're all geared towards community insights instead of sales insights or marketing insights, which you would get with a traditional CRM.
So that's an overview of CRMs in general and community CRMs in general. And I just want to touch on a few of the things that I think makes Savannah um, unique among that field. And Patrick, I hope, is going to uh, do the same after my. So some of the key guiding principles that we had from the very beginning of developing Savannah are it should just work. You should not have to manage the tool. You should not have to spend a lot of time tweaking it or building dashboards or deciding what's important for you. It should have all of that by default. And to do that, we rely a lot on expertise from community managers who have been doing this for years and years or decades to see you know, what are the best practices, what are the right metrics to look at, and surface those by default. We also say that insights are better than metrics because they can tell you more of what you want to know. Metrics might be able to tell you how many contributors you have. They might even be able to tell you if you growing your number of contributors or not. But what it can't tell you is why you don't have as many contributors as you think you should. And that's where insights come in. Insights can look at all of your information together and say, okay, the reason you don't have more contributors isn't because your contributor on ramp is too hard. It's because you don't have enough people in that lower engagement level who are ready to become contributors. You've got a pipeline problem and you need to get more people active and involved in your community before you can move them up to being contributors. We say that relationships matter. That's a key aspect of a lot of the data that uh, Savannah works with is who is connected to who so that we can show, you know, person to person wise, what's important, who's important, who's the anchor of your community that's kind of holding all of these people together. They may not be the most uh, active person. They may not be your top contributor, but they're the person who's making connections between others and helping build this web of connections that really is what a community is at its heart. And then finally, we try and guide you to action. Like I said, it's built on the expertise of a bunch of community managers with years and years of experience. And so it tries to guide you towards what you should be doing, who you should be paying attention to. So it'll give you um, notifications when somebody who has been active in the past becomes inactive and say, hey, you might want to reach out to this person, see what's going on. It'll tell you when somebody's reached the upper edge of one engagement level and is on the verge of going to the next one so that you can go and you can give them that little extra push that they need to become a contributor or to become a core member of your community. So it's really proactive that way and trying to help you do your job and tell you things that you need to know instead of you having to dig through a bunch of metrics and dashboards to find that information. One of the main things is we build automatic profiles. Most of the information here, you never have to enter in. It's all being scraped from your community platforms. It's being aggregated, it's being analyzed, and it's being presented to you in a way that's really useful. So you can see who somebody is, what platforms they're on, what their level of engagement is in your overall community and in segments of your community, uh, what tasks you have to do for them, what gifts you sent, what their activity has been. And it'll show you a breakdown of activity, too, on you know what they're talking about, um, give you a timeline of events so you can see, okay, this one person's becoming more active over time or less active over time. And it builds all of this up automatically. You don't have to do anything to get this. And when I said before, relationships matter, this is one of the, the things that we can do with that information. When we know who's talking to who, we can build this network graph of your community so you can get a visual idea of what your community actually looks like and who is central to that. And again, it might not be the person who's the most active, but it will be the person who's the most connected and making the most connections. We also let you segment your community. So a lot of big communities have, um, are essentially a bunch of smaller communities all working together. And Savannah lets you define what those smaller communities are so you can track their um, activity and their engagement levels individually. And that will also automatically surface who your key people are in those sub communities. So you can say, okay, if I've got a certain sub project, I can say, these are the channels they talk in, this is the tag for it, and it'll automatically say, here's your core member for that project. Here are your contributors and your top contributors for that project. So you can easily pick out you know, who your ambassadors are or your leaders are so that you can um, engage with them directly. We also provide task management for uh, your community activity. One of the big ways that uh, I use this personally is to remind myself to follow up with community members. If I know somebody's working on a project and they say, you know, I'll come back to you in a week, I can set a reminder, say, okay, follow up with this person in a week. Or I hear that somebody's had, you know, a health problem 
and they're going in for surgery, I can set myself a reminder for after their surgery day to check in on them and just say, hey, how you doing? How'd the surgery go? You feeling all right? Um, you know, build personal relationships with people in addition to just the professional ones around whatever tool or software we're doing. It'll also track the gifts that you send. When you put a information about who you send a gift to and when, it will look at their community activity before you sent the gift and after you sent the gift so that you can calculate um, an impact score of what that gift had. And then it'll aggregate all of that together so you can see, you know, okay, stickers have a much bigger impact on people's activity than t-shirts do. So I should emphasize giving out stickers more than I should emphasize giving out t-shirts. And lastly, like I said, we try and give guidance. You'll get these notifications on a regular basis where Savannah um, has a suggestion for you to, uh, to do something in Savannah or to do something in your community uh, to try and guide you along the way um, and give you kind of daily things that you can do to make your community better. All right, so that's my presentation. If you're interested, you can go to savannahq.com or email me, michael at savannahq.com. And I will now turn it over to Patrick so he can share his. All right. Thank you, Michael. Great job. Let me get my share going here. No, you got it going. Hey. There we go. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so, hey, I'm Patrick, uh, co founder and CEO of Orbit. I'm on Twitter at Patrick J. Woods, so feel free to keep the conversation going there if you have any other questions we don't get to during the presentation. Uh, this is some of our team on Orbit Day, uh, which was a pretty fun day we did a few months ago. Uh, we're up to about 18 people now distributed across the US, Europe, and Tel Aviv. <laughs> So we're the creators of Orbit, the software, uh, the, the CRM, and also the Orbit model. I wanted to quickly share some, some things about the Orbit model, though, because it's sort of foundational to how we think about building communities. Uh, you can follow along at orbitmodel.com or on GitHub. Uh, there's the link there. If you just Google Orbit model, it's easy enough to find. Uh, but the Orbit model is a framework for building high gravity communities. And the reason I'm sharing this is because so much of what we're doing uh, with our software is premised on this, this, this um, mental model and this data model. Uh, and so a high gravity community is one that excels at attracting and retaining members by providing an outstanding member experience. Uh, and so, so the motivation for this, you know, why, why did we create a, a new thing? Why did we call it the orbit model? Well, we realized for the past 100 years or so, the sales and marketing funnel has been really the sole commercial metaphor. It's been the only visualization or a way to reason about a person's relationship with a company and vice versa. And we realized that the funnel as a metaphor is great when you're measuring a linear process like a product onboarding or a, an enterprise sales process where there's like four or five discrete steps that everyone must, must do. Uh, but we realized that that community is neither linear nor binary. And so my co-founder Josh and I, before we started Orbit, had spent a couple of years consulting in the developer community space. And every company we worked with had this challenge of they were building community. They wanted to measure the relationship and the change over time. But the only model they had was, was the linear sales and marketing funnel. And that led to all sorts of internal, I would say, strife around what the community team's doing and the impact it's having. So we created this thing called the Orbit model to start to uh, model really from first principles how communities are built and how they can change over time. And the objectives look, look something like this. It's, it's you know, the idea is that if you've implemented the Orbit model, you can help activate people quicker, you'll retain them better. And then on the other side, it will give you um, metrics and data to tell that story more broadly. around. So there's a lot to the Orbit model. The, the, the GitHub repo is pretty in-depth. Uh, so I wanted to quickly just cover some high-level concepts for you to take home and think about today. Uh, this is the visual representation of the Orbit model. It's really a canvas for you to think about the shape of your community. And the idea is that you can segment your community into different groups based on the frequency and quality of activity in your community or as we call it, love. So uh, gravity, love, and reach are the sort of constituent components of the Orbit model. Love is a member's level of engagement and investment in the community. Uh, someone with high love is, is likely to play a key role, uh, like contributing, moderating, or organizing. And you can think of love as a measure of the, essentially the recency, frequency, and quality of a person's interaction in your community. And the second component is reach, uh, which is a measure of a, of a community member's Fear of influence, and it takes into account reputation, credibility. Uh, to boil it down, you can think of it almost as like GitHub or Twitter followers. 
And if you understand the love and reach of a person in the community, you can start to measure the gravity of the community overall. Uh, and so really, if you think about the recency, frequency, quality of contribution, a person's Twitter followers, you can start to model a lot about, about a person's relationship with your or your brand and start to measure how that changes over time. So again, follow along, uh, orbitmodel.com, uh, the orbitmodel.com site is pretty, pretty high level very visual, it's very attractive. The GitHub repo, as you can imagine, is essentially a readme for how to use the Orbit model. And we're constantly refining the model based on community input. Uh, we've had a number of, of, of PRs into the documentation, which has been pretty rad. Uh, but the Orbit model is implemented inside the Orbit product, which I'll talk about next. Uh, but we've got around 3,800 users um, managing around four and a half million community members. And we're getting to see the Orbit model essentially applied at scale. So what we're able to do is feedback learnings from the Orbit model in practice back into the documentation. So we try to keep the theory and practice pretty tightly in sync. Uh, so check it out on, on the repo. Feel free to open an issue or ask a question there as well. Uh, lots of good conversation about some recent updates we made to that. So that's the Orbit model. Uh, let's talk quick, quickly about the Orbit platform. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to get through it quickly uh, as Michael did with, with Savannah. So uh, really, we're, we're trying to answer this question with Orbit of, of who is, who is in the community? What are they doing and where? Similar set of challenges that many tools in the space are trying to, to answer uh, in, a, in a context where a community is distributed across multiple platforms. As a community manager, as a leader, you want, just want to know who's out there and what are they doing in service of delivering an excellent community experience to those folks. So the Orbit platform looks a little bit like this. Uh, on top of it, we have our Orbit mission control, uh, community mission control, which has profiles and reports, activity feeds, alerts, um, and that sits on top of our data platform, which pulls in uh, several first data from several first party integrations, uh, including GitHub, Twitter, Discord, Slack, and Discord. Uh, and then our API lets you pass in members and activities from, from any service you'd like. And then we have webhooks as well that you can, you can send outbound to other systems. Uh, really, it's the, 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 in service of delivering you a view of your whole community at a glance. So we try to highlight new and notable members, like folks that have high reach or high love, uh, we roll up some behavioral segments to show you people who are potentially drifting away, you know, folks who were active recently or a long time ago who haven't been active recently or new and promising members, people you might want to reach out to and um, send swag to or congratulate them or welcome to the community. And then we show um, some pretty interesting roll-ups in, in, in service of what we call presence, uh, which shows you a visualization, almost like a GitHub uh, contribution chart of essentially someone's activity across all of your integrations. Gives you a chance to quickly eyeball and sort through um, your massive communities to help you understand where the opportunity is to engage further. Um, our reporting infrastructure basically takes into account all the activity streaming in from your various platforms. It lets you construct custom dashboards, custom queries, um, and lets you, lets you ask questions like, you know, what's the activity look like on a per channel basis over the time frames in question? Um, and you can slice and dice that by company, location, tag, things like that. Um, and our API lets you integrate with all sorts of data. So um, our users today are, are, are incorporating data from, from first party tools, from, uh, from meetup platforms, uh, essentially everything that our first party integrations do, uh, you can do yourself with the API as well. Uh, finally, the, the search is pretty neat. Uh, you can essentially think of the, the, the search function of Orbit as a, a unified search bar for your community. So if you're looking for contributors or trying to find advocates, the, the search will help you quickly get a sense for who's working on what types of things. Uh, and it lets you sort that by things like love and frequency of contribution. And you can send in data from, from most any platform out there. Uh, you see there, uh, the first party integrations are the one that are point and click. Uh, so in the case of GitHub, you just authorize the Orbit, uh, Orbit app into your, your, your organization and give it access to the repos you want it to see on a read-only basis. Um, but beyond that, you can use our API, you can use our, our official Zapier app to pipe in activities. And then you can send that back out to wherever you'd like uh, using our API, using webhooks, um, some of our users pipe this data into S3 for further analysis, uh, but we really, really want to sit at the, the center of the constellation of tools and resources you're already using to help you better understand who's out there and what they're doing. So uh, that's, that's the quick overview of Orbit. Feel free to check us out at orbit.love. Um, it's free to try, uh, free to use in, in many cases, and it's always free for non-commercial open source projects. So um, give, it a, give it a try and um, let us know what you think. And uh, that's, that's all I've got. Great. Uh, Stias, did you have anything you specifically wanted to say, or are you just here to answer questions?
We have no sound. Yeah, I was about to say I can't hear. I think you're muted. So can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome. So, um, yeah, I think my the perspective my perspective is that um, I started DevRel at NetData, so it was my first gig when I did do this job, and I happened to start using these tools back in September. I think I had a chat with Patrick, uh, like one of the first users, and and I wanted to underline that it's it makes things so much easier, uh, especially for a person who is new in this community management, um, let's say domain. It's uh, both tools uh, allow you to have a peace of mind that I'm not sure I would have. Like you, you can easily say without spending too much time, see that okay, everything is going all right, the community is growing. Um, I am engaging with like most of my champions, so everything's great. And I think that's a great thing to be able to with uh, a glimpse, get a glimpse of what's happening, and then focus on the particular area that you 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 care about. Um, especially if you're starting, um, yeah, they were were uh, great uh, empowerment. So yeah, thanks, thanks for these. And I just <laughs> want to say, um, Adiseas was an early user of Savannah. I know he was an early user of uh, Orbit. He's provided great feedback for us to help us improve our tools over time. Um, and we really, really appreciate that. And thank you for, for doing that for us. And if anybody wants like unbiased user opinion, ask him questions, he's your guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, so... speaking of questions, we have a whole bunch of questions from the audience. Do you want us to read the questions out, or do you want to read the question out and then really answer it? I'll go ahead. Um, I'm going to, in fact, paraphrase uh, one of them because this is a public broadcast. So um, the um, can in it be tied into internal company communication? You know, company for well uh, at Hey Josh, you're, you're, I think you're bringing up another uh, people. Okay. Yeah, I'm it's gonna almost like the cell. Like back a... in here. Um, we, there we we're go. Having That's much sound better. Issues on both ends. So, um, yeah. So the question was, can Savannah be used for internal communications and contributions in a given company uh, to GitHub or GitLab or or Jarrett? Yeah, so we've got integrations for GitHub, GitLab, and Slack. If you're using those for your internal projects, you can hook it up to those. Um, anything that we don't have an integration for, we do have an API that you could use. Uh, and we have a Python client library, too, that makes it real easy to feed data from any system that you use, whether Savannah knows about it or not, um, into the system. And then once it's in Savannah, all the other things know what to do with it. So it can automatically tag your conversations, pull out your key people, and all of that. Okay, so our next question is from James who asks, how do these platforms balance transparency? Like, so contributors can find and interact with each other and confidentiality. So managers can perhaps maybe mark a contributor as problematic. Um, I think James has a bone to pick with somebody. So like, but how do you do that balance between transparency and, you know, internal confidentiality if if that's a so thing savannah doesn't have a public component there it all the data in savannah is only available to the managers who are in savannah um, managing your community account so that's not something that your users are going to be able to interact with it's just a way for you to get this manager level view of uh, your data so all of that confidential information is not put out to the public it's not available to everybody to see yeah, same same for Orbit. That's that's we're we're a community back end essentially that front end points of contact. Okay. Well, and I think I think the next two questions from our our, our listeners may kind of ad address the same topic. Um, Mary and Mike both ask questions about privacy challenges using these kinds of platforms, and um, uh, also you know what kind of privacy protections are in place. 
Um, so can either or both of you answer those questions? Yeah, so for the most part, Savannah pulls in public data. It's not pulling in confidential data. It's not pulling in private conversations. Um, you can follow private repos or private Slack channels, um, but it's going to warn you when you try to add one of those that you might be spilling confidential information and to make sure that you, you know what you're doing and you want to do that. Um, we're also starting to um, build up this concept of user roles within Savannah so that some people can have access to all the information. Some people can only have access to public information and not like private contact information about your members. So you can give a little bit more access to the internals without giving away the farm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's we, we've adopted a, a, a posture of, of privacy first on these things. The vast majority of data that's in Orbit is publicly available. It's, it's stuff that's happening in the open. Uh, so that's sort of like step number one. Um, I think the second question is sort of a, a, a question of, of, of risk for the user. Um, and so what we do in that case is, you know, everything's encrypted at, at rest and in transit. Uh, all the data that's, that's in your Orbit workspace is completely uh, siloed out from any other workspace anywhere else. So we're not moving data around behind the scenes, you know, as you're adding notes and tags and things like that, uh, it's completely private. Uh, we're not selling data or anything like that. Um, and finally, um, GDPR, if anybody's interested in our DPA, we can share that and discuss that. And uh, we've recently kicked off SOC 2 compliance, which is a very fun process, uh, but very important uh, for, for a tool like this. So uh, by the end of the quarter, we'll, we'll be, um, you know, fully compliant with SOC 2. Uh, so, so we're trying to invest early and, and often and, you know, all of the sort of industry standards for, for privacy and security. Okay, great. Um, Yaroslav asks, is there some integration with email systems or Gmail or mailing lists in general or IRC? Like what are the integration uh, channels for communication tools with these platforms? We currently don't so do a lot with email. Oh, sorry. I think we started at the same time no, there. You go ahead. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's sort of a range here. Um, we we support BCC to Orbit, so if you want to like copy a, a, a communication into your Orbit workspace, that's that's totally doable. Uh, beyond that, other communication channels are, are Slack, Discord, and Discourse that we support on a first party basis. Uh, but but email in particular is one that we haven't haven't de developed a lot and directly with um, a lot of reasons related to privacy concerns. Um, you know, fairly heavily. So uh, you can opt to send an email into Orbit, but we're not going to like go scrape your Gmail account, you know, haphazardly. Yes, yeah, so it's kind of the same for us. It, several people have asked about Gmail integration, which kind of surprised me because you do kind of have to give these tools access to all of your emails to do that. Um, and I gather that's maybe a, a more common thing if you're using like a traditional sales CRM. Um, but for my part, it's it's almost philosophical like if somebody's sending you an email that's not a part to, that's not an activity that's happening within the community that's happening in this private side channel that's not um you know helping anybody else or engaging with anybody else so it really doesn't play into you know what's going on in your activity when somebody's emailing you directly the exception to that is like mailing lists where you can have act, the communities that are built strictly around mailing lists um and we don't have an integration for that yet. We're looking into some like groups IO has a nice API that'll let us uh, pull data from their mailing list. Um, so that's something we're looking into. And again, we've got the API, so you can just have a script that will pull through those lists and uh, push those conversations into Savannah. Okay, um, we're coming up on our last question. If anyone has any additional questions, now would be the time to get them into our tool. Yeah. So we can ask our guests. Um, in the meantime, from Michael, um, are there use cases for using community CRMs for non-open source communities? So the example that he cites is um, integrate an integration solution for a music school using something like Zendesk or MPyke 13. Um, so yeah, what 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 would this look like in a non-open source uh, environment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, open source kind of pioneered a lot of the, the community building and best practices. Um, but we're by far not the only industry that has communities. You know, there, there's communities for everything, for, for music, for like phones, 
for bands um, and all of them, anybody who's got a community needs community professionals to help them manage it. And those community professionals need the tools to help them do their job. And I think um, a, a community CRM should be able to handle all of them. I know for Savannah, we try and distill everything down into non-tech terms. So we've got like conversations and contributions, not GitHub issues or pull requests. So you can use it for any kind of uh, community that you like. Yeah, I would say of our 3,800 users, I would say pr probably today, probably 80, 75 to 80% are developer tools or open source or sort of from, from that world. Uh, but when we release our Discord integration and a few others, uh, we've seen adoption in, in lots of other communities, like sort of creator, indie hacker. Uh, we've got a lot of folks that have like a ConvertKit newsletter plus a Slack community. Uh, and those those cover topics all over the place. And so, yeah, we're seeing we're seeing growth in the sort of non-open source segments of our business um, with with the sort of like anchor being being open source. But I anticipate a lot of growth because most community types have this challenge of distributed communities. The, the community is important. It's very online and it's distributed across a lot of channels. That's that's what a tool a tool like this can can really help help solve for. And I think at a low level, all communities generally look the same. You've got the people who are just kind of at the periphery, paying attention, leaving a comment every once in a while. You've got the people who are active on a regular basis, um, greeting those people, pulling them up. You've got the people who are actually leading the community and setting direction and, and doing things to make it better. And I think that's universal. I think every community is like that. And as long as we build our tools around these you know, these base concepts and not anything specific to technology that they should be applicable to to all the communities. Yeah, I would plus one that we, we've seen the sort of adoption of the orbit model style thinking apply across many community types because the idea of wanting to understand, you know, the, the recency, frequency, quality of, of activity across the community. Um, you could be Kubernetes or you could be a running club, you know, and you, you just kind of want to know who, who's out there and what are they doing. So the, the mental model, if appropriate, should scale. One of the other that we have in the is a lot of sort of aggregate metrics for what's going on in the community with tools like Grimoire and Augur um, and DevStats. Um, the uh, and as far as I can, the you know, RM takes a dual view of of community members. Um, yeah, we might need to get Josh to put this in the chat. Damn. We'll get that question, and I'm I'm curious to know the, uh, what the question will be because it's talking about some of the the community metrics work that we're doing at Red Hat, and I'm pretty sure there's a tie-in question here, um, but we'll wait and see. Uh, okay. Where I is yeah. Is this mic any better? Yes. Sounds okay. Um, so. Um, one of the other sets of tools that we've started using heavily in the world of community management are aggregate metric tools, things like Augur and Grimoire that show what's happening across your community in terms of contributions, like, say, how long within, you know, error bars it takes to deal with a new PR from a community member. Um, so first I would say, am I correctly characterizing this, the main difference between those kinds of metric tools and the CRM tools is the CRM tools focus more on the individual community member, and the metrics tools focus more on the aggregate. I mean, would would you guys say that's an accurate sort of characterization? Yeah, I think I, it I depends on the. Focus. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I went the last Sorry. time. <laughs> okay. Um, so I would say that yes, we focus a lot more on the individuals and the individuals' uh, activity, um, but I think that the aggregate metrics are still an important part of that. Uh, I know for Savannah, that's where we pull insights from is by being able to aggregate data together um, and show where people are relative to other people, um, where your community is relative to the past. So those aggregate metrics are still a key part of what we do. It's just not the only thing that we do. It's kind of the the, the engine um, that drives the car, though. Yeah, for us, it's kind of like a question of like where on the ladder of abstraction is, is the question you're asking, where does it sit? So, you know, for our, we have some users that are like, you know, 
EMOs or VPs of community, things like that. And those folks are very interested in aggregate metrics, trends over time, high level insights. And then sort of the other big persona is your open source manager, your community managers, your DevRel people. They're, they're typically interested in questions like, how do I keep people from falling through the cracks? How do I deliver great experience? How do I find those champions and elevate them? And so, you know, a, a tool like this should be able to do both. Uh, and it should be a virtuous sort of a flywheel. So as, as your frontline folks are delivering a great experience, that should on the back end make those, those aggregate metrics look a lot better. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the, the way we think about that. Um, that kind of goes back to what I said about insights being better than metrics. You know, you, what, what Patrick just said, you know, it depends on your questions. And your questions are rarely, how many contributors do I have? It's usually, who are my top contributors? Or are, am I growing the number of contributors that I have? And how can I grow it better? Um, and that's something that metrics alone don't tell you. Um, I'd be interested um, in actually hearing an answer from this on from Odysseus um, in terms of all the tools that you're using. Yeah, that, that was a, was about to say that it's interesting. Um, a very important thing that I learned is that you know one metric or a couple of metrics don't tell um, the whole story. So with these tools, it's very interesting that you can, you know, as you are in the in the in the trenches every day, um, you have like a feeling of what's happening and you can combine that feeling of that uh, aneg uh, anecdotal stories that you have with the metrics and then you can present the whole the whole idea for example uh, a, a very common uh, thing that i had for example i had okay a more more github issues wow that's good right a lot of github issues a lot of activity for the community that's awesome right not necessarily because for example if you go if uh, the metric says that's good, but if you go into the GitHub issues and you are uh, you are every day and you see that most of the GitHub issues is one of questions and then they leave, so basically your GitHub is like a support ticketing system. That's not a community. So even though the metrics are, are going up, in reality the community is getting worse. So um, I, I'm feeling that so being able to combine many different metrics from different platforms. With that story that you know, because you 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 live in these um, uh, in these platforms, uh, allows you to to show insights that other stakeholders wouldn't be able to understand or get easily. All right. All right, so thank you, Odysseus. Um, and thank you all very much. We've gone through our questions. I want to thank all of our guests, uh, Patrick, Michael, Catherine, and Odysseus coming on today. And thank you all for bearing with some of the technical issues that we've had. Um, <clears throat> we usually have a much smoother show, but apparently life is uh, throwing some curveballs at us today. So thank you all to our guests for, for coming in and walking us through community CRM and open source spaces and beyond. And thank you, Brian, for hosting this. And thank you again to Catherine. Um, having us all on here to talk about this was all her doing. Very glad to be here, everyone. Thanks Thanks again. Thanks for, for this. And uh, we have a run book uh, about community CRMs from CNCF. So um, yeah, Catherine shared it in the chat, I see. So yeah, uh, cool. take a look. And we will include the link to that run book when this video is posted internally within uh, Red Hat's intranet and also out on YouTube. So look for that link um, when we publish this later today. So with that, we'll wrap up another edition of Community Central. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We'll be back soon with more um, examinations of open source communities and the ecosystem uh, therein. So until then, have a great and safe day. Thank you, everyone. Bye.